to God. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, how many of you are a brethren? Okay, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Okay, <clears throat> now I realize that, you know, on a Wednesday night, very strong possibility, many of those of you that are here are serving the Lord and in a, probably you're part of the backbone of this church of being able to uh, give of yourself and make things happen here. Amen? Okay, so this should just fuel your tank. Praise the Lord. But if you're not yet on board with helping, serving, and, uh, and moving the kingdom forward, the, then tonight is designed to help you. Make a commitment. Come on and say amen. amen. Praise the name of Jesus. All right. Now, uh, you know, I, I want to just go ahead and address something up front. Um, there's a lot of uh, interchange in our culture. Uh, Social media, news, just talking, praise the Lord. And uh, so, uh, and, and the reason why I'm saying this is because this is a bit of a disclaimer, okay? I don't join in to these things, but there's kind of a tension between generations in America, okay? And uh, the uh, older generation, which is probably me, <laughs> Uh, have had a lot to say about younger folks that are not committed to a lot of things. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to tell you that because we don't believe that here, right. we have, uh, you know, a, a balanced church with a full contingency of young people that defy the odds and are not anything like what are described by others. Okay, are you, are you out there? But that could be because of what we're doing here tonight. We're teaching what the Bible says instead of going with the local trend. So if you're caught up in a trend, uh, you can be delivered from that. Hallelujah. And come into the fullness of God. Hallelujah. Have a, have a full life. Live a full life. Okay, and so I believe in Jesus' name, by the time we get done with this tonight, you're going to want to be a committed person. Okay, so go with me over to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Hallelujah. Promise there from Jesus about committed people. Verse 12, we're starting out here talking about commitment to the kingdom. But there's more to commitment than commitment. Commitment to the kingdom, which we'll, the last one is probably the thorniest that we'll cover tonight. Okay, Revel, Revelation chapter 3, look at verse 12. It says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now stop a minute, a minute and think about what a pillar is. A pillar doesn't move. That's right. the, the entire reason why you have pillars is so they won't move. So they'll hold things up. Yeah. So what Jesus is talking about is people in the church that because of their steadfastness and their commitment resultingly end up holding up things in the kingdom. You know, like these pillars actually hold the entire roof up in this building. Praise the Lord. God is good. Okay, so I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out. There you go. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Now, that just sounds like something that I want. You know, we're talking about future, long term. I like future, long term. How about you? You know, the, the uh, reality about life is... Um, people look at me and they say, well, wow, you're, you're getting older. So are you. <laughs> We're all getting older at the exact same clip. A day is a day. <laughs> so you, you might not be called older yet, but 
you know, you want to be. I, I'm sure you want to live long enough to be called older. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Are you out there? Yes. Okay. So th the point is, is that life has a shelf life. Okay. And regardless of how long you live, uh, should the Lord tarry, eventually your life is going to be over as far as natural life is concerned. So what God has offered us is everlasting life. We're talking about something that never ceases, never fails to come to pass, is continually ongoing, self-perpetuating. These are all characteristics of everlasting life. And so will you be such. And in actuality, uh, you know, all of the thing that we talk about aging is all the outer man. The outer man perishes, but the inner man is re renewed day by day. The inner man will never show a day of age. <clears throat> and so when, you're, when you change outer man's men, when, when the, the outside suit is shifted out for the new model, then the outer man will no longer show any age. Zero, none, zero. So Jesus, who was resurrected when he was about 33 years of age, now is just as vital. I mean, he's, he's a 33-year-old man filled with the life of God. Now, <clears throat> just a little bit about resurrection Resurrection is not the same thing as being raised from the dead. You know, people in the New Testament, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and other people raised people from the dead, but then they died again. Yeah. Lazarus is not alive today. That's the difference between being raised from the dead and being resurrected. Amen. See, Jesus is still alive. So there's something about resurrection life and that new body that is self-perpetuating. It just goes and goes and goes and will never stop. Now, I don't know about you, but that's what I got my heart set on. Yes. Amen, are, are, are you there? Amen. So, I personally, years ago, I decided, you know what, I don't have, any pro I have a problem with making commitments. And I just want to make sure that what I'm committing myself to is worth it. Worth my time, worth my effort, worth my commitment. I found out right from the beginning that the kingdom of God is worth your time and your effort and everything that you put into it because it's the only thing that will last throughout eternity. Amen. You know, the United States of America is going to go away. The earth is going to be renovated. All of these things that you know will eventually pass away and change. Your, your physical body, all of these things have a temporal nature to them. But the kingdom of God is eternal and forever. So making a commitment to the kingdom is really what living a Christian life is all about. You have to decide, well, that's more important than these other things that could take up my time. Glory to God. God is good. Go ahead and say amen. So pillars in the temple. How many of you want to be a pillar in the temple? Okay, well, it's a, it says he that overcometh. How many of you are willing to overcome? There you go. Say amen. Hallelujah. Go with me uh, back over to uh, 2 Timothy. We're going to look at the downside of this. Praise the Lord. Sometimes people don't. Commit, they don't hold on to the things of God. Are you out there tonight? 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 10. The Apostle Paul, if you read 2 Timothy, it's, it's really like the Apostle Paul's sign-off letter. Okay? And uh, so he knew that he was coming to the end of his tenure, so to speak, but he wasn't upset about it. He said, you know, I've finished my course. I've run the race. I've kept the faith. Amen. Now, in, at the end of his letters, 
he and Peter and others had a tendency to sort of catch up on hometown business. You know, would, would you tell brother so-and-so to stop picking on sister so-and-so? <laughs> and don't forget to bring my, my books when you come and things like that. Are, are you there? Okay, so this is kind of like kingdom housekeeping. Amen. Are you there? All right, so the, this is just in mention. The Apostle Paul said, uh, verse 9, he says, uh, Do your diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas... There's no, no mention anywhere else about Demas, okay? But Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Wow. Having loved this present world. Amen. Now, let's stop for a minute and just talk about the world. You know, people, everybody has to deal with the world. When I first got saved, the world was a thing to be shunned. Okay, and wow, you know, I, I barely got out of it. The way I looked at it is that I could still smell the smoke. You know what I'm talking about? I, my, my, my clothes might have even still been smoking. I don't know. But I was so glad to be free from the world. There's no way, no way I'm even going to ever get close to that. So, but, but that was me. You know, not everybody's like that. Some people get saved and they kind of hang between two. You know, they're kind of in the kingdom until somebody steps on their toe or does something they don't like. And then they kind of shift over to the world. And then they go back and forth like this, in and out, in and out, in and out. Hallelujah. Okay, well, you need to understand not every believer is like that. I'm not like that. I have never done that in my Christian life. I don't go in and out. I don't have lapses in service. And I, I don't believe that it's, it's, you know, like some kind of a big supernatural thing about me. I've just decided. I already found out what the world was like, so why would I want to go back to the world? You've got to be kidding Amen. Are you there? Okay. So every believer has to make commitments. No, number one commitment actually is to the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom. Okay. And to forsake the world. Now here this Demas character, you know, he obviously did not forsake the world. Because the Apostle Paul says, you know, well, he's, he's gone back. Okay. Now he's departed to Thessalonica, Crescens, another guy, to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Uh, Titus, there's, the next book is about Titus, so he wasn't backsliding. He was just going different places. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him uh, with you, for he is profitable to me for ministry. So do you see the ongoing nature of the working of the kingdom? Okay. But Demas, I mean, this is just a matter of fact. The, the guy went back to the world. Hey, are, are you out there? You know, now, let's, let's uh, cover something. I believe this will help. You know, we live in a world where um, people are very sensitive about things that other people say about their lives. Okay? Well, the Apostle Paul uh, didn't mind bringing this up. I don't know, maybe Facebook wasn't big back then. I don't know. <laughs> That's just a little joke, yeah. Amen. Are, are you there? Okay, so uh, he didn't mind mentioning, and, and a lot of this is because, well, you know, someone has to set the record straight so that people will follow the right example. Amen. Amen. The right example is somebody who's not going to be turning back to the world every time, you know, there, there's a storm or something comes by. Go ahead and say amen. Amen. So Christians ought to be committed to the kingdom. Okay, glory to God. A couple of small amens, but, you know, it's enough to move forward on. Go with me, if you would, back to Ephesians chapter 5. Hallelujah. Okay, so while you're turning there, uh, <clears throat> got some things to say 
to you outright. This is for every believer, okay? It's, it's not just like, it's not picking on anybody. It's like that old saying, if the shoe fits, wear it. Okay? But th th this is not brutal in any way. It's just a reminder. Number one, you must choose. Now, you need to understand the idea that somebody else is doing the choosing for you is a misnomer. So you think about it like this, how could God hold us accountable for what we do if we're not the ones that are doing it? Now, he knows, and you should know, it, it, you know if you're still kind of living in a, in a it, kind of a zone here, you should know that you're the one that's doing the choosing. If you think somebody else is choosing for you, well, here, here's a little opener for you. You're choosing to let them do that. So you're still doing the choosing. Now, you might be abused. You might be controlled. You might be being forced to do things that you don't want to do, but you're still choosing. You're the one that's doing the choosing. So, uh, like I said, this is not brutal. You just need to understand. Amen. So, that means you can change that. You can change that. The idea that you can't change it and you're some sort of a victim of society is something that somebody told you that's not true. You've been delivered. Woo, go ahead and say amen. You've been delivered out of the power of darkness which means darkness has no power over you. You've been translated out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So if you're saved, you're in the kingdom. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now that you're free, you mean God wants me to choose? Yeah. This is the difference between Jesus and the world. You see, he set you free so you could Make wise choices. And he left your will fully intact and expects you to use it to choose the right thing. Oh, come on, are you out there tonight? So you must choose. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God is good. Now there's some deliberations that go into each one of these things. Okay. Uh, second one, priorities. Let's talk for a minute about priorities. When Pastor Sheree and I first got married, there was a big thing in the body of Christ about priorities. And all the men's groups were talking about priorities and so forth. And, you know, they had it cooked down to percentages. You know, that you should have this percentage for your family, this percentage for your job, this percentage for the kingdom. And so uh, she, uh, we pregnant with the first child, and, and uh, I had never done anything like that before. And so it was like, Lord, how am I going to, where do I put my priority? Okay, how many of you have heard about priorities? Okay, well, here, here's, here's your answer. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom. So what he said to me was, if you do... Everything that my word says you should do, 100%, that's your priority. Hallelujah. Now, I, I thought it was, you know, uh, great. I, I, I was working a um, job at the time that was not high paid. You know, and, and so I set my alarm every, at 530 and got up every morning. And went and got, I still do this, went and got my Bible and sat down and read my Bible. Praise the Lord, got myself ready to go. And then I went off to my illustrious job, $4.35 an hour. I know, it's hard to believe. It, praise the Lord. But <laughs> it did keep grits on the table. Praise the Lord. And, and the electricity stayed on. <laughs> Back in the day. Come on, are, are you out there? Praise the Lord. But I, I had never done anything like that before. Okay, so many of these things are something that 
you have to just go ahead and start doing it. So it was time for me to learn these things. I was a young man and I had to uh, ex experience these things. Hallelujah. And, you know, after working uh, uh, hard all day long and coming home and, you know, and we had a fledgling little ministry. And so it didn't stop when I got home. This is the reason why I was asking about the priorities. You know, we, we actually had what was called a, a house ministry, which meant the ministry was in the house. So when I got home, the ministry was there. Now, we just had a few people living in our house, but there was all these other Christians that we were um, discipling. Yeah, that's the right word. Discipling and, and you know, it, it was like hand-to-hand -hand combat. Not with the people, with the demons that were controlling their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Woo, go ahead and say amen. So this thing about priorities, you know, I, at first I, I thought, how in the world, am I, how can I do everything 100%? You know, it's because I, I was thinking limitations. Right, right. But I found out in God, the power of God is what makes up the difference. And then you're able to do all these things. Are you there? So when you're talking about commitment today, you know, people, it's, it's the same thing. People say, well, how can I, you know, uh, keep food on the table, take care of everything that needs to happen with my family and still be committed to church and, you know, be committed to all these things. How can I do that? Well, you have to cast off a, and, and abandon yourself. One of the things I found out is what I, I had to forget about myself. Amen. And, you know, it, it's like we, we go through this thing uh, now in our personal lives where uh, real men change diapers I'm glad my mother taught me how to wash dishes, yep. iron. Yep. Hey, you know, I, I teach the, the help how to iron. <laughs> they have to take lessons from me. So, so this is not some sort of a, you know, uh, kind of a uh, free ride type of a lifestyle. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Are you out there? So you could be really working hard. Join the club. That's right. Soldiers in the army. So I, I, I personally have been doing this for over 40 years. You know, and people started saying, well, you know, retirement and all this stuff. And I, I thought, well, I'm not going to retire. The next thing you know, I've got three new jobs. In the kingdom. Hallelujah. Thank you. So it didn't get lightened up. I just, it took me 40 years to learn how to do 12 things at once. Amen. <laughs> amen. Ooh, hallelujah. God is good. Can somebody out there say amen? So priorities, your number one priority is the kingdom. Now, uh, we're about to talk about family, okay, which is the final thorny subject and marriage praise the lord but here's here's something that, that might sound way out there for you but here we go if you want your family to make it you're going to have to give 100% to the kingdom because if if you let your family dominate you and your time and and, and they get the best of you what you're actually doing is setting them all up for failure. The devil, I believe that, that you have something on your life from God. If you take what he put on you and focus only on them, you're going to kill them. The devil will make sure that you never get through with problems. 
So when it comes to priorities, you have to forcefully shift away from yourself and, and actually, forgive me, this is a little blunt, but family is self-serving. It's not sacrifice because it's not the family next door. It's your family. Lord, bless me and my wife, my son John and his wife, us four and no more. That's Farmer John's prayer. I learned that in Bible school. Ooh, thank you, Lord Jesus. How many of you can see this? Okay, so that, that's what happens, and, and many people don't know this, but if you allow yourself to get distracted, whatever it is that gets your attention is the thing that you're going to destroy wow. with your attention. Because the devil, see, it all goes back to the pictures that you see in the Old Testament. So when uh, the people... Instead of worshiping and serving the living God, they decided to make one, make a God. Okay, and so then they, they thought, oh, well, we just have a little shrine here. I mean, it's, you know, and th th this was their thinking. Okay, well, God told them, well, here, here's what's actually happening. When you're worshiping that idol, you're actually worshiping a demon. So what he was saying is the devil superimposes himself on the thing that has your attention wow. so that you end up worshiping him with your attention. Wow. You didn't know that? Glad you came to church tonight. Ooh, are you out there tonight? So you have to keep your focus on the kingdom. Go ahead and say amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 5, the last one here. Here's an example. When you read this chapter, there's a big temptation to only focus on the family part. Okay, but as he talks about marriage, he's actually using the covenant of marriage as an example for the new covenant. It's a type. You act like you didn't know that. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. He says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That's just generally church life. And then he says, verse 22, narrowing it down to the families. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's popular today. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as, the, as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. That's even more popular. Are you there? Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be the, to their own husbands and everything. Now, let's just, for, for a moment, let's just drop the, the, the wedding, the marriage part. And look at what he's saying about the church. The church is subject to Christ. Do you see that? Now, many believers just look right over that, don't even see that. But that, that's what's called covenant language. Okay, so when you call him Lord and, and you have to confess Jesus as Lord to be saved, believe in your heart that he's raised from the dead and confess with your mouth that he is Lord. Okay, Lord means ownership. So by calling him Lord, you're calling him your owner. Are you out there tonight? Now, this sounds wonderful to somebody that's committed. But people that struggle with commitment and have all sorts of other ideas, this is a nightmare. They don't ever want to hear anybody talking about this. But the New Testament is really clear. We're bought with a price. We are not our own. You and I cannot live our lives unto ourselves. Our life does not belong to us. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. We've been bought with a price. Hmm. 
Now, hallelujah, it's like what the Apostle Paul said, I do this thing willingly. Don't have to talk me into it. I found out what the other side was like. Can't talk me into going back there. So I gladly and willingly bow my knee to the Lord Jesus Christ every day and serve him. And I don't mind saying with my mouth that I'm his servant. Oh, you're his friend. Yeah, I'm his friend too, but I'm his servant too. I have to hear that I'm his servant so that I get the correct message of where I stand. Well, I, I know I'm a member of his body, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, but I'm still a servant. I report for duty every day. My life does not belong to me. Ooh, thank you, Lord Jesus. God is good. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Head of the church, what does that mean? That means he's in charge. Now, this is another thing that's not popular. Come on now, are you out there? God is good. How many of you realize that Jesus is in charge of the church? It's not you. How many of you understand you're not in charge? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Is it okay with you that Jesus is the head of the church? You see, see what we're doing here? This is actually building commitment. Because what you have to do is bring down all these barriers of thought that have been erected. Why do you think the people in the world are so uncommitted? Because all they live for is themselves. It's all about them. Everything is about them. They will never have peace. Not just simply because they're serving the devil, but, but they, they, they believe and think that they actually have freedom. Ooh, come on and say amen. Are you out there? Now, this is all just New Testament. Might have been a while since you've heard it, but this is all Bible truth. We're bought with a price. Lord, it's a thorny subject. Glory to God. All right, so look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. All right, so Jesus is actually himself living for us. Okay? Now, wait, wait, wait a minute. I, I, I thought he was God and could do anything he wants. Well, I, you could say that if you wanted to, but this is what he's chosen to do. Remember when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he went through the thing with God about his will? He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. So Jesus consigned himself and resigned himself to the will of God, which was he was giving himself up for us. He is the ultimate sacrifice. There's not one shred of selfishness in him. Zero. None. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. God is good. Somebody out there ought to say amen. Okay. Hallelujah. Now, here, here comes the thorny number three. Are you ready for this? Let's talk for a minute about marriage. Because marriage is used here as a type. Okay? And he's kind of going back and forth between the new covenant and the marriage covenant. Because they're both blood covenants. Okay? So when people have, uh, and, and this is, you know, you can go just to about every culture in the world and people swear a vow. Okay. Well, it might have been, they might have sworn this. You might have said, you know, said different words. But here's what you did not say. You did not say, I will do my part if you do your part. 
Have you ever heard a marriage vow like that? No. That's because it's not in there. Are you there? Now that's called a unilateral vow, which means that your keeping of your vow is not contingent upon obedience on the other side. Amen. So you're bound to your vow even when they're not keeping theirs. Couple of exceptions, death is one, fornication, adultery, the other one. But otherwise, when you swear a marriage vow, you're bound. Now, what are the similarities between that and the new covenant? Well, when you prayed the sinner's prayer, that was your unilateral vow. You had to swear your way in. You had to swear off other gods. That was what you were doing when you call him Lord. That means that he's the one that's in charge in your life. Ooh, thank you, Lord Jesus. God is good. Are you out there? Now, so uh, a couple of things about, well, how do I, on a practical level, how do I build commitment in my life? Okay, well, here are just a couple of simple things. Um, Jesus said it. You're not going to like it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. He said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Right? Okay, so what was he referring to? He was referring to covenant position when you're in covenant with God and there's something in your life that stands as an alternate or an alternative, it's going to end up destroying you. So people, they get married and then stand around talking about divorce every time they get mad at each other are leaving an open door as an option to get out of the relationship called divorce. As long as that option is there, they'll never be committed. Ooh, is this too blunt? Now, it was late one night. Uh, we uh, were having our, you know, the, the, we had been up all night talking. Praise the Lord. And the, the sun started coming up. The birds started tweeting. We're actually in somebody else's house. And, and the Lord said to me, he said, well, if you're going to have peace, what you're going to have to do is close the door. Stop using the word divorce as an option. Close the door and, and accept what you've done you have been married. You are now married. Now, here we go. Are you ready? You are married to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're betrothed to him. There will be a marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven after he takes you out of here. Come on now, are you there? Right now, the bride of Christ is being prepared for that ceremony. The spots and the wrinkles are being ironed out right here in this chapter. Ooh, thank you, Lord. Now, none of that happens without commitment. You see, this is the thing about commitment. If you're not committed, you will not allow yourself to be changed. You're going to hold on to your old ways, your own ways, your, your own thoughts, because you're not committed. Oh, it's just too blunt. Now, if you want to have peace, you're going to have to make a commitment. You're going to have to make good on your commitment to the Lord, first of all. Right. Hallelujah. He said, I am the way. <laughs> right? Are you out there? There's not more than one way. Amen. There's one way. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Now this, this is one, this, this is warm and fuzzy 
on the inside of somebody who's already committed. You see, here, here's the bottom line. When people are not committed to church, they're also not committed to the kingdom. Now, they might tell you all kinds of things, but it's not true. Yeah, and it's right there in the New Testament. How can you say that you love God who you can't see when you don't love your brother who you can see? 1 John chapter 3. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. God is good. Well, you're still here. Praise the Lord. God is good. Okay, commitment is not going to hurt you. Now, part of getting your mind renewed in today's world is accepting commitment. Because in today's world, people talk their way out of everything that requires something of them. Hallelujah. This is just a little fun. You want to have a little fun? Years ago, we had a contractor in the church. And uh, he was talking about hiring people to work for his company. And uh, he was talking about young people, young guys. This was almost 20 years ago, so it was a different young guys. <laughs> Hallelujah. But he, he was saying, you know, he hires them, and they, they come to work, and then he gives them something to do. He was like a, a contractor redoing houses. Okay? And so here, here's what their answer was. Well, I showed up, and you want me to work too? <laughs> See, that's a mindset of no commitment. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God for his grace. Yeah, it's a true story. Uh, I don't remember the brother's name, but... Uh, he went to India with us a bunch of times. He's a good brother. Real honest. Hallelujah. God is good. Okay, going to ask you to stand to your feet. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. How many of you got something out of that? <laughs> Amen. See, if you're committed, this soothes you. You go, wow, I don't feel so strange. Well, you're not strange. If you're committed, that's the way you're supposed to be. You know what it's called? It's called faithfulness. Now, faithfulness is not continuously doing a job to your, your, your work, your family, or your church. Faithfulness is to the Lord. So you don't run out on Him every time there's some new thing going on. Read, read the Old Testament. This is what they did. You know, every time they turned around, it was some new thing. Hallelujah. But there, there was a group that were committed. You know, I, I really love to read the Old Testament because those, those prophets, you know, when they were calling it what it was, do you realize how unpopular that was in their day? I mean, it's, a, it's amazing, a miracle that you would even have people that could think like that. Where did, where did they get that? Well, they got it from God. That's the way He is. Hallelujah. He's faithful. Thank you, Jesus. One of His characteristics Hallelujah. He's committed. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. Let's have a confession. Say this with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to be committed to you and to the kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus, I want to act this out in my life Every day, Every day. All, day. all day, thank you, Jesus, for teaching me how 
to commit myself. Thank you, Father, for your characteristics. Loving kindness, mercy, gentleness, faithfulness. Father, you are faithful. I want to be faithful all of my life. I aspire to faithfulness just like you. I want to be just like you in all of my actions, my thoughts, my words. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.